Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Beyond Emergency Funding, Sustaining Public Health Funding in the Post-COVID Landscape. I am Mila Becker, Chief Policy Officer at the Endocrine Society, and also serve as President of the Coalition for Health Funding. Uh, the Coalition for Health Funding is the oldest and largest nonprofit alliance working to preserve and strengthen public health investments in the best interest of all Americans. CHF is pleased today to be co-hosting this event alongside the Trust for America's Health. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few important housekeeping items. Real-time captioning is provided today by Serena of AI Media Captioning Services. For captions, click on more at the bottom right of your screen with the three dots. Next, click on closed caption. Because we are using Zoom's webinar format, all audience members are muted throughout the discussion, but we do want to hear from you and we'll be taking questions at the end of our panel's discussion. To ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, not chat, Q&A. Please type your uh, question. You can begin submitting them now and throughout the presentation. When you submit a question, please be sure to include your name and the organization you are representing. Now down to business. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen Congress appropriate a significant amount of emergency funding to respond to the pandemic. This emergency funding was critical due to our country's underfunded public health system. In today's briefing, you will learn why emergency funding alone is not enough to build a strong, sustainable public health ecosystem that will be resilient in the face of the next public health emergency or pandemic. And importantly, why robust and sustained federal funding is necessary to protect and promote the health of Americans during all times. I would like to introduce today's speakers who will share what public health is, what funding is used for public health, and why sustainable routine funding is so important. First, Dr. Michael Frazier serves as the CEO of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. ASTO is the nation's nonprofit organization representing public health agencies of the United States, U.S. territories, and the District of Columbia. ASTO members, the chief health officials of these jurisdictions, are dedicated to formulating and influencing sound public health policy and ensuring excellence in state-based public health practice. Under his leadership, ASTO has received multiple Power of A awards from the American Society of Association Executives. For ASTO's outstanding performance and contributions, the ASTO team has made to advance the work of its members. Our second speaker is Lisa Macon Harrison. Lisa is the local health director in Granville and Vance counties in North Carolina and has worked at the intersection of public health research and practice in North Carolina since 1995. Ms. Harrison previously worked with the North Carolina Center for Public Health Quality, the North Carolina Division of Public Health, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on a public health infrastructure grant for performance improvement. She served as president of the North Carolina Public Health Association in 2015 and was elected to represent five Southern states on the board of directors of the National Association of County and City Health Officials, NHO, from 2018 to 2021. She now serves as president. Dr. Nadine Gracia is the president and CEO of Trust for America's Health, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public health policy research and advocacy organization that promotes optimal health for every person and community. Dr. Gracia is a national health equity leader with extensive leadership and management experience in federal government, the nonprofit sector, academia, and professional associations. As president and CEO, she leads TIFA's work to advance sound public health policy, address the social determinants of health, advance health equity, and make health promotion and disease prevention a national priority. So all three of these speakers are gonna make everyone feel quite inadequate. We appreciate your time today 
And with that, Dr. Fraser, I'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Well, thanks so much. I, I hope nobody feels inadequate. We, we all have gifts to bring to this conversation, but thanks to, um, to Tifa and the coalition for the invite to participate. As, as Mila mentioned, uh, ASTHO is the national organization that works with all of our state and territorial health officials and their leadership teams. We advocate in our nation's capital on behalf of uh, public health infrastructure and building our governmental public health system and work both with TIFA and with NACHO very closely. So it's wonderful to share a panel with friends and colleagues, all of whom are as dedicated as we are to create the public health system this country deserves. And if we, you know, the, the message of this um, conversation is really, we can't do it on emergency funding. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about why and then offer some uh, ways forward to build a public health system that works for all America. Um, so in the next slide, uh, I just wanted to start by um, a very prescient quote by uh, Tom Cole, representative from uh, Oklahoma, uh, in a testimony presented uh, earlier this year uh, at House Appropriations. He said, as I've told our own side, and I think the last year has illustrated to all of us, sometimes you need to spend billions to save trillions and just look at the cost of what this pandemic has been. A cost in lives, over a million lives lost to COVID in our country alone, not to mention the global toll, and an estimated 16 trillion US dollars in overall global uh, response and recovery efforts to COVID. And had we had we had a public health system, had we had public health system investments well prior to this pandemic, both of those numbers would be far lower. I'm, I'm uh, just 100% convinced that that's the case. Um, in the United States alone, we've spent 4.6 trillion in emergency assistance to people, businesses, state and local governments, and healthcare systems. What if we had used just a fraction of that? three, five, 10 years ago to build the capacity of our public health system and our partners to respond to infectious disease outbreaks that we know are coming and we've experienced uh, uh, years past. So on the next slide, um, I just wanted to share again, this vision of how different would our public health response have been if public health agencies were fully resourced to carry out a range of infectious disease surveillance and monitoring that included global signals and trends, something we've been talking about for years, uh, having outposts globally to signal uh, potential threats to our nation, or had data systems that were fully integrated between healthcare and public health organizations at the local, state, and federal levels. That's, that's not the case today or had the capacity needed to quickly scale and surge disease investigation and health communications workforce. These were two very weak areas early uh, in the pandemic and continue to be areas for, for improvement when we look at how do we scale up when we have disease threats and how do we communicate to a public that needs information so quickly, uh, no health department had the communication capacity it needed. What if we had the, the infrastructure to quickly develop needed tests and supplies and support our lab, laboratories in, in doing that testing? And what if we had adequate investments in community-based public health work, focusing on achieving health equity and optimal health for all, not as a pilot project, but as a core business of, of local and state and territorial public health agencies? All of, the, all of those are things we've called for for years and we've received interest in, but unfortunately when it comes to appropriations in the past, we've been left out or we haven't realized what we fully needed to build the public health system we need. And instead we spent $4.6 trillion to respond to a pandemic over the last two years. Bad investment. <laughs> um, and the next slide, I just wanted to point out um, that this is a tale of woe that many of us as public health advocates have shared over, over uh, decades where we are on a public health funding roller coaster. Some of us see feast and famine. Some of us call it panic neglect. Some of us call it boom and bust. But on every significant public health disaster or emergency, this country has rallied to support its public health system, but it's been episodic, it's been time limited, and it's been disease specific. So competencies developed in the response to H1N1, to Zika, to Ebola, and now to COVID are specific to COVID. When those run out, 
the funding's gone. The people to respond are gone. The systems and systems maintenance and sustainability are gone. And that's what we've got to stop doing if we don't want to spend another 4.3 trillion in the next infectious disease outbreak that affects us all. On the next slide, you'll see um, what we're talking about is sustained funding for governmental public health agencies that truly builds the capacity of state and local governments, tribal and territorial governments to provide the foundational public health services to their communities. In some states, those are offered directly by a state health department. In other states, those are offered by local public health agencies that work in partnership with the state health department. In tribal areas, that's offered by the tribal public health agencies. And in the territories, territorial governments all work to provide these foundational public health services. But what we have now in governmental public health is a constellation of grant programs that unevenly, uh, nationwide, unevenly addresses these foundational systems. Not, not every state has every public health program that it needs to assure the conditions for everyone to experience optimal health. And we need to fund foundational capabilities things that keep the organization running, things that cross cut program areas and instead build, uh, allow the, the uh, health agency to build the capacity needed to do its business, to share its data, to work in partnership with communities, to do all those things um, that we know are important to a, to a functional high-performing public health department. Of course, all of that is rooted in equity, something we'll talk more about hopefully uh, in this webinar and, and certainly well into the future. Um, but on the next slide, this, this situation uh, that, that we have with data modernization, is actually a really good example. We, we rallied interest with partners. This, this work's been led by many of our ASTO affiliates, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, the, American, the uh, Association of Public Health Laboratories, the Health Information Management System Society. Many partners um, prior to COVID sat down and said, we really need to address our, our data systems. We need to improve our data systems. We need a plan for modernization and we need an ask to fund it. And over the last few years, this is uh, obviously uh, right as COVID started, we received, we, uh, received congressional appropriations for 50 million. In 21, we received an additional 50 million that, that goes to CDC, to, to the states. In FY22, 100 million and over 1.2 billion has been appropriated thus far. That's helping build sustainable data infrastructure, a crucial uh, problem in our COVID response was data sharing. Um, this is gonna help solve that problem. But on the next slide, you'll see, while 1.2 billion used to feel like a lot, um, it, the actual ask uh, that what it's really gonna take to bring us together on the next slide, Tim, I don't know if you can forward to that, is 37 billion, a 10 year investment uh, of 37 billion. So we're talking big numbers here to establish the kind of infrastructure we need to share data, to read those signals, uh, all that it takes to build a functional uh, data system for public health agencies. So these are big numbers, um, but certainly important uh, if we are going to uh, realize the public health system that, that we want in our country. On the next slide, um, we're heading towards a very a uh, difficult time for public health agencies at the end of this quote unquote boom cycle. Many COVID specific funding lines have been spent or have expired and they will create a gap or a cliff. Um, and again, we'll find ourselves uh, even potentially as early as the fall in a situation where things we need to respond uh, won't be available to states because we focus purely on emergency appropriations and not a sustainable infrastructure. So what's the ask? On the next slide, we're really thinking about the future. And this is a long game. We were so pleased to see the creation of the uh, Public Health Infrastructure Fund with an initial investment of 200 million this year. We're asking again for that to be um, sustained into the future. Um, in the Build Back Better bill, which obviously uh, didn't go anywhere, we had a seven billion ask over five years to, to create that fund and to um, invest in that fund. And we still think that um, we've got we've to maintain and grow uh, our public health infrastructure fund for the future. 
Um, sustained flexible funding is just as important as sustained programmatic funding. Um, we don't want to grow uh, one area of the health department and not others that, that share and, and um, exchange information and staff. So this it's very important that as we think about uh, future investments in uh, public health infrastructure, that they remain as flexible as possible to support a, a wide variety of needs in very diverse communities and, uh, and across the states. So we're hoping to see for FY23 and beyond uh, increased investments of this infrastructure fund. Our ask for 23 is an additional 1 billion uh, into the public health infrastructure fund, which goes to states and locals and CDC to provide those foundational capabilities. Uh, and a, a, a total investment of 7 billion over the next five years in, in the public health infrastructure fund. There's a lot of work to do. We're looking forward to working with our partners, all of you as, as advocates to tell the public health story about why sustained funding is needed. Even as we look back on the COVID response, we can all point out where things would have been better had we invested earlier. Uh, and let's not do that again. Let's build the public health system we need. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mike. I'm Lisa Macon Harrison, and I am currently serving as the president of NACHO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, as Mila mentioned. So I'm going to take you through a few um, on the ground examples of some of the things Mike has just talked about. And um, from where I sit in a rural two county public health district in North Carolina, I serve about 100,000 population and I have approximately 90 of um, wonderful public health workforce doing the hard work of public health every day. Next. I, I want to make sure that we stress that public health um, is, is very different from healthcare in the way that that we are able to provide population health, environmental and systems change work in addition to a lot of the things you've seen and been more familiar with during the pandemic. Next. Uh, one of the things that is my why um, when I advocate for and when I talk about future funding for public health is, is uh, this picture of smiling faces of my health promotion and wellness team. So I think the public health workforce community by community is certainly our most significant public health asset. And without them, we could not worry so much about modernizing data structures or making sure that we are offering um, enough vaccine for the community or enough testing opportunity when it comes to new diseases and emerging issues. We need these folks on the ground, in community, with relationships, with built trust to make the work happen, no matter what the modernization of work ends up being. So I also wanna point out that this is my health promotion and wellness team in my two county district. And every single one of these 11 individuals are grant funded. So I have one job as a local health officer in a two county district. I have a second evening and weekend job as a grant writer and grants manager. We have to manage about a million plus dollars per year to support people like these doing the work we know needs to be done that is not otherwise funded at the local state or federal level in a rural district. Next. NACHO, our National Association of County and City Health Officials, is here to make sure that those working across all local health departments in the United States, nearly 3,000 of them are supported. We offer skill building resources and programs, focus on health equity, and make sure that our systems and practices are what is needed, which is why we're here today to talk a little bit more about those systems and practices and the funding it takes to get there. Thank you. Next. So there's a lot of diversity in both how public health is organized and also who we serve across the nation and how this work is executed. So this is true in school systems as well as public health systems where we have sort of a unique answer to what is needed community by community, county by county. And as you see, in sort of that dark teal, the majority of our health departments across the United States are in a decentralized system. The also majority is serving a small to medium sized population. Whereas the larger health departments, only 6% of those health departments at the local level who serve a population of 500,000 or more are serving a lot of Americans. So when we talk about infrastructure and when we talk about supporting our workforce, we're talking about doing it in a, in a similar way across the US, but know that 
we depend on county governments to be our partners in this, which makes it a little bit more complex sometimes. Next. So what is the work that we should be doing in 2022 and beyond? And what are the structures, investments, and policies we need to get there? That's what we're asking ourselves. That's what we're having a lot of exciting conversations about. Um, and I'm really excited we get to think through this today with you all to make sure that we're in the right, moving in the right direction. Next. We talk in public health often about essential services, core functions, and now foundational capabilities. As Mike said, we um, certainly need more in the way of communications after the pandemic. I think that was a foundational capability we knew we needed to invest differently in across our nation. And we are very good across the nation in public health at partnering at the local level. So there are things that on this list that we need to improve on. There are things that we're already experts in and there are things we could just fund differently to be more effective across the board. Next. I think it's important to recognize that public health is the convener of community. And no matter where you find a local health department, they don't do the work that they do alone. And you know, I think we're having really exciting conversations about new ways and non-traditional partnerships that we can forge. It's a little harder to do this in, in larger communities, but you also have more people to do more partnering with. In rural communities, these are absolutely um, the foundation of the work that we do and the connectivity that we have with partners in local community makes our response to emergency situations much more effective. Next. So a lot of people have realized that we're here to give immunizations, that we are here to distribute vaccines to partners, that we're here to provide testing and education and information, and that we have the skill set around epidemiology, but people don't often realize the number and types of work that we accomplish every week in a local health department that spans across lots of different occupational specialties and expertise levels and lots of different kinds of work. Um, and I think it's important to point out that each of these approximately 30 types of work that we do across the nation are separately funded with separate agreements in large part separate um, guidance for reporting. And in effect, it causes us to manage a lot of different ways of reporting back how we are spending funding on these different types of work that we're in charge of. It's exciting work and it's good work and it's a lot of different work. I think often I hear when we orient a new employee that they're astounded by all the things that they didn't realize that we did in public health. Next. So many states are similar. There are a few nuances to this, but in general, along the left-hand side are those mandated services. We all provide environmental health. We all provide communicable disease control, vital records registration, health education promotion, and conduct community health assessments regularly um, to make sure that the community gets to have a voice in the priorities where we focus a lot of our energies. And I'd like to point out that on that left-hand side, even though these are usually codified in law in general statute from state to state, they're not often funded by state level governments. So oftentimes, especially the communicable disease, the vital records, the health education and health promotion, none of which are fee generating or revenue building, those have to be sponsored at the local level by county commissioners or grants are usually funded for those if states do not have the funding for that kind of work. On the right hand side, we provide assure or contract different services depending on where we are and what the needs of that community are. Some of us provide primary care and dental health. Some of us provide medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Some of us do jail health. Some of us partner with others who do that work. Next. So I think over time, it's important to note that we have lost a lot of our workforce. And just as we were turning into the pandemic response, we realized we were 20% less on FTEs to do the work of public health from the downturn economically in 2008 to 2019. This graph shows that 20% decline in full-time equivalents in public health services across the nation. 
Next. And then the revenue source picture is just complex. Um, there are a lot of different sources and this again varies community by community, just as you would see in a school system. Some poor rural areas have less county or local funding. Some systems in, in the local level that have more ad valorem tax or property tax have more money to put into their public health system. But suffice it to say that there are a lot of different sources that you have to meld together and make work and these different sources have different requirements. Next. So here are a few things to take away about funding in a local health department. Primary categories of, of revenue are local, state, and federal, and that does include fees like Medicaid and other sources, typically grants, that remain um, in an important level of funding source for a local health department for their budget and their staff. As I said early on, our workforce is our most significant asset. It's also where the revenue goes to, to make sure that we do the work. Our biggest cost is our workforce. Approximately 25% of our health department budgets in North Carolina come from state and federal combined on average, and the rest of it is for us to make up at the local level. And that just goes to show what a difference there is in the rural urban continuum. Um, accountability is high. We are a governmental entity. We receive lots of audits. I don't go a month in my role as a local health director without uh, hosting an audit from some program or some funding source. Um, so I, I think it's important when we talk about new funding and new funding flexibility that we understand local governmental entities are highly accountable to the dollars that we're given. And my local health department alone, we have more than 85 different banks um, of different revenue and related reporting requirements that are required with each of those sources that look different. Next. So, you know, over time, what we have funded in public health are parts. And a resilient public health system is more than just the sum of its parts. Um, the National Academy of Sciences pointed out that the current financing system of health in the United States is profoundly misaligned because we put most of our money into the treatment of disease rather than the prevention. And then the prevention has all of this complexity related to it. Next. I liken our budget at a local health department level to a game of Jenga, actually. And I think today um, starts a number of conversations that are so important about how we're thoughtful together to build a stronger system, to be more prepared for emerging diseases, pandemics, public health challenges. But please keep in mind, there's so many different parts to consider. When we, when we push over here, it pulls over there. And when we pull a Jenga, um, piece out, it, it could risk other pieces falling. And so we really need to make sure that we're paying attention to all of the parts and pieces because every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And those of us who are real strong believers in quality improvement and do that work understand that we've got to look at the whole system in order to affect and change the whole system. Next. I just wanted to share just a few pictures again, of my why um, and, and the people that are doing this work and the people that are motivating me to look at how we can make changes and make the system easier for these dedicated, hardworking, skilled professionals to have it a little easier. These last two years have been tough um, and, and we want to create a system that's easier for them to work in. And just a few more slides there, Tim, and we'll be all finished. I just wanted to show you a few of our vaccine clinics and the hardworking people um, that, that really show us how important the work of public health is in our local community. And that it's up to us to figure out what we need to do our best work and what we need to do to give them a, a system to work with them that works better. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Gracia. Thank you, Lisa. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadine Gracia, and I'm the president and CEO of Trust for America's Health. And it is such a pleasure to co-host uh, today's briefing and webinar uh, with our partners. Mila, thank you very much for, uh, for moderating this, today's conversation and, and for co-hosting this with the Coalition for Health Funding and to be joined uh, by friends and colleagues, Mike and, and Lisa, so wonderful to be with you, longstanding partners of ASTO and NATO uh, that our organization has had the pleasure of working with. Next slide, please. So just to share with you a little bit of background uh, with regards to uh, our organization, Trust for America's Health, commonly known as TIFA. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public health policy research and advocacy organization. 
Uh, we use data and research uh, really to analyze critical public health issues uh, and advocate for evidence-based policy changes that will help to protect the public's health uh, from issues uh, that range from substance misuse to chronic diseases to public health emergencies. And annually, we uh, release a, a report that examines the impact of the chronic underfunding uh, on a, America's public health system. We'll be releasing this year's report uh, next month, later this month. And our reports are intended to inform policymakers, other organizations, the public and the media of the importance of a strong public health system, as you've been hearing uh, from Mike and Lisa and Mila today, uh, and not just uh, during times of emergency, but certainly also every day in non-crisis times. Next slide, please. So, you know, Lisa actually alluded to, to some of this, talking about um, the work of public health. You know, one of public health's challenges is that often the successes of the field are often invisible, uh, you know, not known to the public. And this can make it easier for policymakers and other decision makers to overlook uh, when it comes time to fund this critical but often unseen work that is so vital to promoting and protecting health and communities. Looking at this slide, one of the striking uh, comparisons is the share of our national health expenditures that go to public health and prevention, including state, local, and federal spending. In our 2021 public health funding report, we analyzed the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services national health expenditures for 2019 and found that total spending on public health and prevention represented about 2.6%. That's less than 3% of the total $3.8 trillion in expenditures. That was the lowest level since at least the year 2000. And in comparison, we just analyzed the 2020 numbers and the share of, of national health expenditures increased to 5.4% of the $4.1 trillion, largely because of the significant emergency funding spent on the COVID-19 response. And that's the largest share that we've seen in decades. Uh, however, as you have been hearing, short-term funding is not a substitute for sustained investment in public health. And Mike said it, this is very telling because rather than investing in systems and people, the workforce that we need to prevent illness and promote health and, and prevent injury, we spent billions of dollars, trillions for, for the public health and medical response to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, what we also are seeing as a nation is that public health threats are rising. We're seeing that in weather-related emergencies, chronic disease, injuries, uh, and yet, when we look at funding for public health nationally, uh, it's not keeping up with what we're seeing with regards to the rising public health threats. We can look here, for example, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is the primary federal provider of public health funding to states, and that CDC's top line budget has not grown accordingly to meet these challenges. And what that flat funding has done is it's made it difficult to keep state and local health departments fully staffed with a qualified health workforce. And that's been exacerbated, exacerbated due to burnout among staff, as well as even the harassment and attack on public health officials that we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in addition, CDC hasn't been able to make vital improvements to infrastructure, especially as it relates to laboratory capacity and data modernization, as you've been hearing. And so we need to have increased investments to ensure that we bring our public health system into the 21st century. And you've heard this as well, that another challenge that is facing public health spending is that it's often siloed and it must be spent on disease specific line items. And while funding for conditions is important, we also need to ensure that we have funding that is really meeting these cross cutting approaches because constraints are making funding for effective and innovative cross cutting approaches to prevention difficult because the funding lines are inflexible and they're often underfunded in the first place. Another challenge that we often see with inadequate funding is that many of the evidence-based public health programs that do exist, they can't be funded in all 50 states and the territories. Just to give you a few examples, the State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program, which addresses the root causes of overweight and obesity, there's only sufficient funding to fund it in 16 states. When we look at the racial and ethnic approaches to community health, the REACH program, which is critically important to providing culturally tailored uh, interventions and programs in communities of color to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities in communities that have high burdens of chronic disease. While the CDC received 264 eligible applications in 2018, it could only fund 40 of those applicants. We can look at the issue of climate change with the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative, which helps health departments 
address equity and social determinants of health as it relates to climate adaptation, and yet it can only be funded in 11 states. And lastly, we can look at the issue what we know that is critical, which is around substance misuse and suicide prevention. With the comprehensive suicide prevention program only being able to be funded in 11 sites nationwide. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at this issue around emergencies, a key problem that has also made our nation more vulnerable to health threats has been funding cuts to critical emergency preparedness programs. You know, when adjusted for inflation, the CDC's public health emergency preparedness program, which is shown here uh, in, in orange, uh, supports four emergency readiness capacity in states, territories, and, and localities, and it's decreased by 25% over the last two decades, or over 50% if you account for inflation. With the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Responses Hospital Preparedness Program, which helps to prepare health systems, hospitals, and health systems for emergencies, that program, shown here in blue, experienced a 46% cut over the same period, or 62% if you adjust for inflation. The challenge here is that these programs are our first line of defense. And because of these cuts, public health doesn't have the resources to be able to respond immediately when adverse events, such as the COVID-19 pandemic or a natural disaster happens. Next slide, please. Now, Mike re referred to this with regards to the boom and bust. You know, if, if, instead of upfront funding that really would work to prevent these crises, our responses are often dependent on supplemental funding. And while supplemental funding is important in public health emergencies, especially given the magnitude of many of these emergencies, in most cases, this funding is temporary and it's not gonna create or sustain the vital improvements to public health infrastructure that we're here today to talk about. You know, supplemental funding cannot build solutions overnight and it takes time for the funding not only to be approved, but also how best to get those resources out. And in a public health emergency, every second counts. And these delays give the threats an even greater chance of taking hold. And it also means difficulty maintaining a workforce. The workforce is depleted and people can't be rapidly hired and retained with just short-term funding. And once supplemental funding expires, what happens is we see that the public health system is again left vulnerable to the next crisis and the boom and bust cycle repeats itself. And it's only through increased, sustained, consistent funding over time that we can prepare to prevent and respond to these crises in a timely and adequate manner. Next slide. So as an organization, we certainly are advocating for um, specific recommendations to the federal government to be able to address uh, these shortfalls as it relates to our public health system. Uh, we need to increase the CDC's top line to enable the agency to invest in cross-cutting initiatives that strengthen our public health system. And we also, as we've been describing, know that it's important that we truly bring the public health system into the 21st century, ensuring that we have diverse, qualified professionals who have the expertise and resources to be able to deploy modern techniques to meet these rising public health threats. And so Congress should be investing in public health infrastructure, data modernization, and the, and the public health workforce. That we also have to ensure that there are investments in health security that are going to protect the nation and ensure that we're not caught flat-footed in response to the next public health emergency and have, have a much better alternative to what has been the boom and bust cycle of supplemental funding. And we have certainly all described it. We have seen it, how COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated health inequities in our nation. Long-standing social, economic, environmental, and health inequities. And so we must invest in addressing health, dispar in, in addressing health disparities and assuring that we have tailored interventions and resources that are reaching communities that have far too long suffered from these disparities. We need to address root causes through social determinants of health. And we know the president's budget for fiscal year 2023 requests $153 million to expand CDC social determinants of health work, which would support the very multi-sectoral strategies to address drivers of health inequities and high rates of disease. And as I noted earlier, CDC has as well, many evidence-based programs that are only active in certain states and localities due to budget constraints. And if we have more robust funding, we can expand that type of critical work to more communities across the nation. So certainly our work is there before us, but this must serve, certainly the pandemic must serve as a clarion call for action for our nation to finally, truly invest in our public health system. Thank you, and I look forward to our conversation.
Thank you very much to all the panelists for their presentations. We're now going to segue into the Q&A part uh, of this briefing. I want to remind all attendees, uh, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A uh, uh, section at the bottom of your screen, and please uh, identify yourself in the organization that you are representing. Um, First off, we have a question about communications. And I think uh, there's a lot of consensus, right? That uh, how important uh, communicating effectively public health messages is. We saw that uh, during the pandemic when there was a lot of confusion. And the question is um, about um, any funding that's currently allocated specifically for public health communications, uh, particularly funding that will support local and regional efforts. Um, maybe our uh, NATO and ASTO representatives can take this question. Sure, I'm happy, Lisa, if you want me to start or if you want to start, feel free. Um, you know, so I'm not aware of a specific public health communications line. I think that's the issue that we're trying to highlight here, which is there are core capabilities like communication that um, currently, uh, you know, a, a health department has to potentially um, tap across programs or use as part of their indirect um, or not have it at all. And I think we've seen that, uh, you know, many smaller agencies that just don't have that core capability. But you know, even at the state level, um, I think there's lots more that, that could be done in terms of funding public health communications. The uh, affiliate of ours, the National Public Health Information Coalition, is all the state public health information officers and some locals. Um, they may they may track that more closely. I'm not aware of, of any specifics for that, but it's certainly part of what we call you know those foundational capabilities and would be um, fundable through some of these infrastructure dollars if they were flexible. Uh, and allowed for it, which I believe believe they will. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, yes, communication is a key cross-cutting need in public health. We often have trained um, public information officers or PIOs related to preparedness and response, but there's oftentimes as the, the funding dwindles for preparedness and response between emergencies, um, a lot of times there's not enough money at the local level for that FTE to be present. So you have to divvy up those responsibilities across people who have that skill rather than hiring specifically for communications. And then now with social media, um, keeping up with the most modern and effective ways to visualize and educate and provide communications effectively in the realm of, of this world of misinformation to boot, it's just a new skill set that we, we need to hone and make sure we're also um, funding. Yeah, it's so important so that people don't only hear about public health when it's a problem, right? Um, uh, the next question is a three-parter. Um, what was, uh, what was funding for public health like before the pandemic? What has emergency funding allowed you to do? And why is sustainable and robust funding so critical? Mm. So I'll jump in here and reference my Jenga game because I do think that's such an important visual that of all the, the 30 things on the one slide with all the bullets where I said we do lots of different programs, oftentimes we'll receive, for example, $5,000 for one program and $30,000 for another program and $26,500 for another and so on. And so what happens in poor and rural areas is that you have to have a, a, a rural health nurse um, be specialized in being able to report to and, and work on four or five different programs to help cover that FTE salary and benefits. So there's a lot of wearing of many hats, as we say, to be able to get the work accomplished. That's how funded, that's how programs have been funded in public health in large part you hear us say, but disease specifically. And because of the high accountability to the public dollar, which we certainly don't agree, disagree with, there, there's a lot of responsibility for each of those disease specific areas to get a lot of work done. So the money doesn't match the time spent on the program is, is the upshot. So what emergency money can come in and help us do 
is focus on the cost of, for example, testing and vaccination are two buckets of funding that we have access to at local health departments. We want to be able to provide testing and vaccination when that is needed. The challenge is by the time it gets to the local level after going through the proper processes at the state levels, sometimes it's a, a less time on the timeline for us to spend it. And we get it oftentimes after the surge or demand has happened. And there are restrictions in place that we can only spend the money for that particular thing. So, so I think the requirements that are so stringent and the reporting that is not flexible it is part of the challenge, whether it's regular funding, as the question asker asked, or whether it's emergency funding, those restrictions on what you can spend the money on still remain in either case, and, and the timeline gets shorter and shorter with uh, it getting to the local level. And Mike might have some other things to add, especially those centralized states that are able to do some really interesting things through contracting and emergencies that have been nice to see. Yeah, no, I, I would just echo what you said. I mean, I think that the emergency funding, there was lots of different pots of it. There was very specific funding for particular things like school testing um, that allowed us to scale up. And then there was some more flexible funding that allowed for things like contracting to bring on uh, additional disease investigators or public health nurses or program managers. So it was varied. I think the, um, the emergency funding was used really to scale uh, and provide surge uh, to meet the demand, um, but also to uh, fund some core capabilities like communication, like information technology, like um, some of the HR cross-cutting issues. When those go away, which they will, uh, it becomes a, a pretty significant problem. Okay. Um, next question. In terms of responding to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, because we're still in it, um, and preparing for future public health emergencies. Can you be a little bit more specific about what areas of our public health system need the most attention? Well, I, I, I can start if you want. I mean, I, I think we've highlighted um, the data and data systems needs. Um, and I think those are incredible uh, given, you know, we, we don't need last year's data, we need real-time data for decision-making. Um, I think the workforce uh, challenges in terms of expanding the workforce, you know, the staffing up project um, from Fancy and Fab uh, presented a, a couple months ago, might've been longer ago than that, suggested we need 80,000 new public health professionals just to maintain core capabilities in foundational public health services, not necessarily to expand and innovate. That's a lot of people to be hired. Um, there is a new $3.9 billion grant program that CDC announced late last week to, um, for five years for states and large locals to, um, to recruit. And we're excited about that. Um, I think that that's huge, you know, in terms of dollars, but also in terms of impact. Uh, even when you even when you divide it by fifty nine, um, and then finally, I think equity work around equity, the work of community engagement, um, the work of of how do you support and sustain uh, work with the communities most impacted by things like COVID. Um, how does a health department deploy resources if it's centralized? How does it work with locals and community groups to support that when they're decentralized? Um, that infrastructure, again, can't be uh, based on philanthropic dollars or based on pilot projects. It needs to be a core capability of health departments. <clears throat> and it's one, you know, as Lisa mentioned, she's got a team that I'm sure could use more folks because there's so much work to do. One of the things people said to me is, why would we hire all these community health workers and then have to let them go after COVID. And I said, you know, the last time I checked, there's plenty of sick people and plenty of work to do in terms of management of chronic disease, as well as, you know, just overall health literacy work. We can certainly deploy people to when there isn't a pandemic that we, that we need to do more generally. So I think those to me would be the three areas, data modernization, workforce, and equity to start. Yeah, I, I would agree with that completely. I, I don't have much to add, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Gracia, but I, I do think that modernizing our HR practices and government systems is badly needed at local, state, and federal levels. You know, making sure that we can cut through some of the time it takes to um, hire and, and put people in place, that's also something of a barrier when we have limited funding for emergency response. 
Yeah, I, I agree with uh, certainly with Mike and, and Lisa and, and just underscoring some of their points. I, I think one is that we, we're talking about these lessons learned from, from the pandemic and certainly we're continuing to learn lessons as we continue to navigate through the pandemic is we've seen this in past public health emergencies as well. And so that centering, I'm gonna start with the last point Mike raised around equity and the centering and prioritizing of equity. There were partnerships some that existed prior to the pandemic that existed in local communities and at the state levels that got enhanced because of the pandemic. There were some that were formed anew. Mm -hmm. And part of our charge needs to ensure, how do we now think about as we continue to navigate through the pandemic and beyond, how to maintain those types of partnerships so that we actually talk about the promotion of health and well-being because the pandemic has exacerbated those inequities. And so if we don't have an intentionality to the investment to the workforce, to the resources in particular that are going to the communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, all of the gains that we have seen over the years, the trust that needs to be earned in communities or rebuilt in communities is going to be lost. And so we really have to have that centering across everything. When we think about data, there's, there's our ways for equitable data practice. When we think about the workforce, it's ensuring that equity is infused within our principles of, of workforce development. And when we think about community partnerships and community engagement and, and actually decision making and planning from communities, that centrality of equity is going to be critical for us to truly learn one of the key lessons from this pandemic as well. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. I have another one that um, I think touches on the equity issue as well, um, and it's more of a clarification. Um, there was a question about states relying um, on the federal uh, funding. Uh, as their sole funding. Can you clarify that public health is a combination of funding sources and why federal funding is so important as a component? Yeah, and, 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 and absolutely, Mike and Lisa, I know we'll have some comments on this as well. So indeed, uh, you know, the, the federal government is a critical and vital source with regards to uh, public health funding uh, to states and, and localities, to tribes and, and, and territories, and understanding that there is a governmental responsibility to pr protect and promote the residents' health, uh, ensuring the conditions in which everyone can be healthy. So there is truly a responsibility of the government to ensure that, and that's not only in times of emergency, but also in non-emergency times to ensure that well, you know, we have access to clean water, clean air, uh, safe and healthy foods, to ensure that there's access to services that really promote health and, and well-being, but that is one source of it. And then you see what we've been describing, this patchwork that then exists at the state and local level with regards to that implementation of the dollars that come from the federal sources to then uh, the states and localities. I think a key, a key message that we certainly uh, champion is the importance that uh, there's just been an underinvestment as a nation. We are not seeing the health outcomes that the investment that we have or the spending that we have as a nation with regards to our health expenditures. We are not seeing the health outcomes that we should be seeing as a nation for the level of health expenditures that we have. And, and in significantly, what the federal government can be looking at is what is the proportion of that that's actually going to prevention and public health and how we actually transform that to then assure that we can actually have healthy and resilient communities because the current funding model is not, is not attaining and reaching those goals specifically. Thank you. We, we get that uh, question a lot. Why can't states just put up the money if they need it so bad? Um, I think that the reality of the situation is complicated, but um, simply put, you know, states have to balance their budgets and the federal government doesn't. Um, states aren't necessarily willing to raise taxes to pay for public health services and are making other decisions like making sure their Medicaid program is uh, solvent or education or transportation. And so I think it's unrealistic and, and probably a non-starter to put that back on states. Um, many states do put general funds into their public health uh, agencies, particularly around particular state issues, like they can add newborn screening tests to their panel. They, they may have environmental issues and special mandates and funds that they use. Uh, and locals put in a lot more. I think Lisa's slide is 25% of locals uh, are federal, 25% of local budgets are federally funded. We know some states in, in the union 
upwards of 70% of their public health agency budgets are federally funded for public health services. Uh, the average is, is around 50%. So there is a state contribution, but it cannot meet the need. I think COVID showed us that pretty clearly. Uh, the federal government uh, drives uh, the public health system because it funds pretty much all of it. <laughs> And if we really believe in health equity and we know we're only as healthy as our neighbor and the next county over, we've got to come up with a better way to fund more equitably across the nation or else we're going to have, you know, um, just a lot of, of more need for response that could be better coordinated if we had a more substantial federal level of connectivity to the work being done on the ground. Excellent. Okay. Um, I now have a question for uh, I'd love to hear from each of the panel members. Um, and that is, where do you see the greatest opportunities for public health to collaborate with other health system partners? Are there any use cases that come to mind around data sharing across clinical and public health partners? So I'll be glad to jump in and just get started. I also saw in the chat that someone had a question about ARPA workforce. So this gets a little bit at that too. We, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and in rural areas, what we've needed to do to, to be high performance performers in public health is to write and manage grants, as I said. So we have an academic health department model. And I think to answer your question and to answer the question in the chat at the same time, forging partnerships with academic centers when it comes to grant writing, grant management, data management, and data sharing are really essential. We are lucky in North Carolina. I am in a rural um, district, but I am not too far away from Duke, UNC, and NC State universities who provide opportunities for me to partner and have expertise that I would not either be able to afford or employ um, in a local health department, but can certainly forge partnerships with. So both for ARPA workforce creative approaches, we're doing postdocs and working with national clinical scholars to help elevate our practice in public health as one of the things we're helping fund. But I would highly encourage us to all think about how we partner with our academic institutions for data management and modernization as well. Dr. Gracia. Just quickly, I would say what Lisa highlighted is what we're what we're advocating for around why social determinants of health work is so critical to work across sectors and, and build those types of partnerships. That's also where investing in and, and for example, building up uh, CDC social determinants of health program, which would provide greater resources and funding to state and local health departments to engage in those types of multi-sectoral partnerships. That too is where we don't have funding, adequate funding to support that type of investment in multi-sectoral partnerships that can create health system, health care to, with public health, academic institutions, and also other sectors such as housing, transportation, food safety, et cetera, which are so critical to addressing really the, the structural drivers of health and promoting the community conditions that optimize health and well-being. Dr. Fraser? Just to add to those, you know, I think some of the use cases we've seen that are that are really important and, and need to be expanded are these healthcare public health connections, either around COVID and infectious disease, around vaccination, around chronic disease, around overdose and behavioral health. So lots lots of opportunity there, and um, I think taking what folks have done and, and spreading that is is our goal with some of these dollars. Because as mentioned, not every state has the same portfolio. Last question, it's going to be a lightning round to the panelists. I'd like you to share what you think the biggest takeaway is for the audience from today's conversation. Dr. Gracia? I think it's the message that we, we started with. The theme of this is that emergency funding, while important, is not sufficient uh, for our public health system and that we need to truly invest and increase uh, and sustain funding in public health and assure that that funding provides the flexibility to meet the core foundational capabilities of public health. Dr. Fraser. I, I think sometimes you got to spend billions to save trillions. And um, we, you know, we've proven that and we need to stop that cycle and spend the billions um, because I think we've got lots we, we could do. Ms. Harrison. And I'll round it out by saying local public health entities are trusted governmental entities to accountable to every public dollar we receive, and we must do a better job managing 
the the streamlined and, and flexible nature of those dollars to honor the workforce that does the hard work community by community to keep us healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to all of the attendees. We have recorded this session and we'll send all registrants a copy of that recording. Feel free to share it to your with your communities. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.